all my life I've had a fascination with music. As a child, my parents had always loved searching out the newest CDs, cassettes, records, anything they could get their hands on. They were obsessed with it. They even named me Axel, after the vocalist from Guns N' Roses. And although they were borderline crazy, to this day I can say the exact same thing about myself, though probably not to the same extent as them. Back in 1999, I graduated from the University of Houston with a degree in music history, and then another in music theory a few years later. I know, I'm crazy. Last year, in August of 2007, myself and my colleague Nathan prepared for a trip to Bhutan, a country we both always dreamed of visiting. The reason for visiting, however, was not as leisurely as we would have preferred it to be. We found an online chat room post from four years prior that claimed to have found a specific song that would permanently change the personality of anybody who heard it. The majority of this webpage was written in Donka, the language native to Bhutan. It referred to a song with a phrase that roughly translates to infinity song. It sounded insane. But upon scrolling further into the page, there was a grainy, pixelated photograph of an old Tibetan text. From what I could decipher, it seemed to be a drawing of a man playing a flute with some kind of animal standing in front of him. We decided to look deeper into the rumor, and as it turned out, more than one anonymous source had mentioned this. And after a few phone calls, we were able to locate an old Tibetan man in Bhutan who could teach us more about this life-changing music. Less than a month later, Nathan and I packed our bags and set off to Bhutan. Although we were both incredibly excited to visit this small hidden country for the first time, it would be impossible to say that we weren't nervous. We were there to research a topic that could change the way the world views music, but that didn't stop us from enjoying every step of the way. Not only was Nathan my colleague, but he was also my closest friend. Nathan is a tall, skinny, clean-cut man of Canadian descent. I, on the other hand, am a short, slightly overweight American man with long brown hair. Not exactly two people you'd picture being best friends. But we went through college together, and he was the only person that could understand and relate to my crazy obsession with music history. With him, the trip was sure to be an unforgettable experience. Several plane rides, taxis, and private escorts later, we arrived at the location we traveled across the world to see. It was a heavily weathered Tibetan-style temple a few miles south of the famous cliffside monastery, Tiger's Nest, in Bhutan. It looked very old, thousands of years old, but somehow still inhabitable. We walked closer to the temple as the escorts left us. A noticeably old man wearing a damaged blue robe opened the door, bent over as if he was in immense pain. He greeted us and took us inside. As we walked through the doorway, we were surprised to see that the interior was in considerably better condition than its exterior. Although there was no electricity in the building, the hall was lit by a row of candles along the clean white walls on each side of us. Nathan pointed out a small Buddha statue about 12 inches tall sitting on a decorative table in the hallway. As we walked past it, we simultaneously realized that the statue was solid gold. The Tibetan man led us to a small room with three wooden chairs and one candle in the center. We all took a seat, and without wasting a second, the man's voice scratchy and strained told us that the music we were in search of isn't actually music. It's a series of notes that when played on a specific instrument can activate a reaction in your brain and give you indescribably intense hallucinations. By his wording, the effects sounded more like a psychedelic drug trip than a life-changing song. He then told us that the instructions to play the notes were burned thousands of years ago to avoid anybody from playing or hearing the notes accidentally. But before we could express our disappointment, he revealed that it was secretly passed down through his family due to his ancestors being highly skilled thieves who stole a copy after its initial discovery. He leaned forward and got much more serious. Do you want me to play the notes? Nathan and I paused. We looked at each other for a brief moment, then agreed, knowing that this would change us forever. It was a stupid decision. 
But after coming all this way, with both of our lives leading up to this discovery, we couldn't possibly refuse. We sat there silently as he pulled a brass and gold lingam from the table nearby. Linghams were traditional instruments used frequently to play Bhutanese folk music in the history of this region. It looked like a strange mix between a flute and a clarinet. He put it to his lips and started playing. The notes didn't match up or flow smoothly at all, but as I heard more and more, it started making sense. It was like I was playing along in my head. Somehow I knew the notes even before he played them, but I've never heard this before. It sounded like the wind whistling, being frequently interrupted by high-pitched notes that felt like they were about to rupture my eardrums. After only about 20 seconds, he lowered his instrument into his lap. He looked up and made eye contact with me, waiting for my reaction. I was calm, but confused. That was it? It was a unique experience how I somehow foresaw the notes before he played them, but it definitely didn't live up to the rumors. Everything was fine, until I looked to my side. Nathan was sitting there, eyes rolled back in his head, pale. I was too shocked to move. And before I got the chance to speak, his eyes snapped back to normal. Just as I began feeling relieved, Nathan screamed horrifically. Absolute terror poured from him as his blood-curdling screams ran out. He jumped up, not even taking breaths, just releasing agonizing shrieks of horror endlessly. He jerked his arms back and forth, spinning, falling over, as if mortified by anything and everything around him. I've never seen this kind of pure terror come from anybody, not even in movies. I didn't know what to do. I immediately pulled out my phone and dialed the U.S. Embassy and begged them for help. At this point, the Tibetan man in the blue robe had packed up his instrument and walked into another adjacent room. His demeanor was unfazed. He had clearly seen this before. Meanwhile, I tried everything I could to calm myself down and maintain what little sanity I still had at this point. My best friend was suffering beyond comprehension right in front of me, and there was nothing I could do to stop it. I waited in that room for hours until the embassy arrived. Nathan never stopped screaming. The agents sent by the embassy were able to take us back to America. It was a long and very difficult trip that I'm glad I'll never have to do again. Nathan was being treated the entire flight, so I was forced to sit alone and listen to his muffled, terror-filled screams from behind a door on the plane. We arrived in Houston, Texas, coincidentally, the city that I'm from. Nathan was taken to the hospital for more treatment, so I followed as closely as possible. I barely left his side for three days. It took 36 hours for him to finally stop screaming, and then the next 36 to become stable enough to make eye contact with whoever was standing in front of him. He was unable to speak, but he was finally aware of his own consciousness. Nearly a week had passed since the incident, and I still had no idea what the hell happened. I was finally starting to relax when I got an urgent call from the hospital to come quickly. They said they learned something I might want to hear. I drove to the hospital as fast as I could, still confused by everything. Thankfully the radio played some comforting and familiar music to help calm my nerves. When I arrived, I parked my car and ran into the emergency room. A staff member guided me and sat me down at a desk in a very professional looking office room. The doctor came in soon after, sat down, and what he told me will send shivers down my spine until the day I die. They got Nathan to speak. He told them what he saw. When the notes were played, it shut down part of his brain. All his senses and perception of time were affected. For me, it was just 20 seconds of random notes and a strange familiarity with the song. But when he heard it, his senses failed and sent his brain into a coma-like state. He saw nothing but an infinite void of emptiness. But the scariest part is that due to his perception of time being heavily distorted, he claimed to have been trapped in that state for years, even decades. He felt and heard nothing at all besides somehow feeling every single second that passed by for several years. That would be enough to make anybody go clinically insane. This all happened eight months ago now. I hadn't noticed at first, but that foresight I experienced in Bhutan had stuck around. 
when I hear a new song, it feels like I'd already been listening to that song on repeat my whole life. As much as I always loved music, already knowing every song that will ever exist has made me lose interest in the subject. Music isn't exciting anymore. That strange song really did change my life. But either way, I guess I should consider myself lucky. My best friend Nathan was admitted to a psych ward indefinitely. I actually received a letter today, hand-delivered by a man in a black suit. There was a letter and a folded up piece of paper in the envelope. I grabbed the letter first. It was from one of the head doctors at the psych ward. It explained how just yesterday, after begging the doctors for months, Nathan was finally given a lethal injection to end his insanity. I grabbed the folded up piece of paper and upon unfolding it, my heart dropped. The writing was scribbled crudely with a pencil unmistakably from Nathan in his distressed state. It said, Thank you for everything, brother. I'm sorry.